in, we're going to present him with a gift. Hi everyone, I'm Will, I'm 16. So, I grew up in a Christian family and I went to church each week and I was surrounded by people who all loved Jesus and told me all about God and Jesus and how if I trusted in him, then my sins would be forgiven. But up until my early teenage years, I didn't really know it in my heart and I hadn't had a true faith in Jesus. So as I got a little bit older, when I was maybe 13, 14, I started to really think about what I believed and why I believed it. And as I started to question the Bible and God and Jesus, I, I had a lot of questions, I did a lot of thinking, and I looked at the evidence. And after that, I really was convinced that the Bible was the truth, that God exists, he came to earth as Jesus, and that he, he, he died, he was crucified, and he was raised on the third day. And after that, I would say that was when I really put my faith in Jesus. And what that means is that I recognized that I was myself as a sinner and that I needed God's forgiveness. And I asked him for forgiveness and I asked him to be my savior. Now, after putting my faith in Jesus, um, I, I, I'm not magically not a sinner anymore. I still sinned, I still messed up every single day. But the great thing is that God forgives me and that with his help, I can improve and that I can be more like him every day. Um, yeah, following Jesus is just amazing because I have an assurance that despite everything that's wrong in the world, I know that he's in control. And despite all the wrong that I can see in my own heart, I know that he still somehow loves me. And I'm getting baptized tonight because uh, I, want, I want to follow Jesus' commands and it's command to get baptized. And I want to show everyone that I've committed my life to him. Okay, so don't stand too close there. Sorry, don't stand. All right, don't stand too close. I keep hold of you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Bible from the church. The one thing that you were saying there is that you searched out for the word of God. So our verse for you in there is John 14, verse 6. And it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. We just pray for you that uh, through reading the word of God, that that love will grow deeper and deeper. Thank you. Okay, uh, Hudson. Uh, I remember being five years old and uh, we did our devotions every night. Then one night my mom was talking to me about the gospel and asked if I wanted to be a Christian. I said yes and accepted it. Jesus into my heart. Now I'm being baptized to show my faith publicly. So another gift for it is a youth Bible for you called Engage, the NIV version. But it is the verse that the, uh, the church leaders want to give to you. And it's uh, 1 Timothy 4 and 12, and it says this. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Okay, Sophie. Hi, my name's Sophie. I'm 16 and I've been going to Bethel for around 10 years. I rejoined this church over a year ago, and a year and a half ago, and I've recently felt a stronger connection to God by going to Girls Brigade, YPF, Hub, and working at the Holiday Bible Club. I've been lucky to be brought up in a Christian family, and it's given me the chance to learn about and understand God's message. When talking about what God has done for us, it makes me feel so loved and devoted to him. During September last year, I went on a weekend away with Youth Club, and during the devotions, I felt that God was speaking to me and I hadn't felt that previously. I knew that it was God and he was trying to reach out to me. After that, I started getting involved in the church more by becoming a young leader in Girls Brigade, helping in Holiday Bible Club and going to YPF more consistently. I want to be able to pass the message of the Lord on and teach people about him and all he has done for us. I believe that he is by my side and always will be. When times have been rough, I've always had a feeling that there was a stronger presence that was looking out for me and there to take care of me. A verse that's really started to help me sometimes recently is Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. And it says, your life is not defined by the approval of others, but 
of God live for an audience of one. Some people feel like they're going through life blind, but once I started to believe in God and trust in him, everything became more clearer and he started to guide me. I want to be baptised to show God that I'm devoted to him and that I'm ready for him to guide me for the rest of my life. So, do you know they all get Bibles? That's the gift of the church. So, one for you. And uh, the verse that Josh has picked for you says this. This is, in, uh, funny enough, in Joshua, chapter 1, verse 9, it says, Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you. Let me just turn that back around. Move there, that. Good old... Sorry. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And this was a promise. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I think I'm more nervous than the kids up here. <laughs> Technology, look, it's gone even smaller. <laughs> okay, so sorry. So let me just read that again. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And this was a promise given to Joshua and is extended to us through the book of Hebrews, which you just mentioned. Okay. And you've said that you know God is with you always and hold on to those promises. Thank you. And last but not least, Christian. Christian, I'm 16. So, um, I grew up in a Christian family, and as a kid, my mom would take us to church every Sunday, and I would go to Sunday school. At the time, I was really innocent to really question the truth behind these Bible stories. And when somebody asked me why was I a Christian and why I believed in everything, I couldn't really give an answer so I wasn't really I couldn't really call myself a Christian at the time it wasn't a, uh, until my teenage years when I really started thinking about about it all and I, I realized as I, as I kept thinking the more I thought about it and the more research I did the harder it was for me to disagree with with, with everything the Bible said and that's when I realized that I was a sinner and I needed to be saved by Christ. And now I try to be more aware of my sins and pray for forgiveness when I am unkind or selfish. And I am really thankful for, for Jesus for being able to forgive me when I was being so nasty at times. And it is really encouraging and that is really encouraging for me because I know that I am saved, and I know that I have someone who is always there to help me, and I want to be baptized to, to be able to say this publicly and to encourage you to do the same. So here's yours. I've got a student uh, study Bible, and. Um, it's really encouraging to hear your testimony. Really encouraging. Josh has picked this verse for you. It's Matthew 5, verse 16. And it says this. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and we give glory to God in heaven. Thank you. confessed uh, sorry let me start that in Christian have you confessed to the Lord that you are a sinner do you believe that Jesus died for your sins on the cross and that he rose again from the dead yes. 
And Christian, with God's help, do you commit to living in obedience to him as your saviour, your Lord, and your king? Then come and be baptised. Do you need to take your glasses off, mate? <laughs> we'll be finding all sorts at the bottom of this by the end of it. <laughs> Christian, on repenting of your sins and of your confession that Jesus is now your Lord, your Saviour and your King, we baptise you in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, Hudson, you're next. Stay there, mate, stay there. <laughs> Nothing wrong with being keen. You're doing great. Okay. Hudson, have you confessed to the Lord that you are a sinner? Yeah. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins on the cross and that he rose again from the dead? And Hudson, with God's help, do you commit to living in obedience to him as your saviour, your Lord, and your King? Then come and be baptised. Hudson, on the repentance of your sins and your declaration of Jesus as your Lord and your saviour and your King, we baptise you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Will. confess to the Lord that you are a sinner? Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins on the cross and that he rose again from the dead? Yes. And will, with God's help, do you commit to living in obedience to him as your saviour, your Lord, and your king? Yes. Then come and be baptised. Well, on the repentance of your sins and your declaration that Jesus is now your Saviour, your Lord, and your King, we baptise you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Becky's coming down and Sophie. <laughs> Sophie, have you confessed to the Lord that you are a sinner? And do you believe that Jesus died for your sins on the cross and that he rose again from the dead? And so, if you with God's help, do you commit to living in obedience to him as your saviour, your lord, and your king? Then come and be baptised. So, if you on the repentance of your sins and your confession that Jesus is your saviour, your lord, and your king, we baptise you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
great stuff. I hope you are encouraged tonight. And we're going to head off. You thought the young people were nervous. I can't swim. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit... I'm a bit uh... <laughs> Okay, I've got a single verse to read. Um, we've forgotten the Bible reading, but if we'll get up on the screen, if we get 1 Timothy 1 50, there it is. Lovely, thank you. I want to tell you one story, read you one verse, and answer one question tonight. So the verse is there up on the screen, if you can see it. The saying is trustworthy and deserving, deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. The story I want to tell you happened uh, ooh, 30 or so years ago. And I know it well because it happened in my house. It was a typical school day evening. My three children were all up in their bedrooms, Quite an achievement. The eldest, James, was in the front bedroom. His twin sisters, Hannah and Rebecca, were in there, in the back bedroom. Toilet, teeth, stories, prayers, done. And we were downstairs, sitting, relaxing. A time of peace and tranquility. A picture of domestic bliss, if you will. When all of a sudden, there was a crash. A loud crash that made me leap up and run up the stairs two at a time. Probably couldn't do that nowadays, but no, I did up two at a time. And I arrived at the top of the stairs to see Hannah running out of her room, along the landing and into her big brother's room. Now, if I can paint a picture for you of what this was like. James was, I won't say lying, I'd say reclining upon his bed. Relaxing. He had a few bits of Lego strewn about, some on the bed, some on the floor, ready for me to step on the next morning. He had a little cassette on his chest of drawers, playing probably a Roald Dahl story, or maybe the kids from Wizzy World, one of his Butlin's tapes. And he was lying on his bed, leafing through an AT manual, casually looking at the, the adventures of B.A. Baracus and all his mates, you know. Will he really go up in a plane? Oh, yes, he did. But whatever the story was, he was reading the story. And his sister comes running in, and she says, James, James, Rebecca's fallen out of the top bunk. That was the crash. Rebecca's fallen out of the top bunk. And James maybe lifted one eyebrow, maybe a slight shrug, and said, what's that got to do with me? <laughs> now, you might think that's a typical big brother, I don't know. But that's the question I want to answer today. You've seen these, these people be baptised, and maybe it's a bit strange, maybe it's unusual, maybe you've never seen it before. And you might think, well, that's fine for them. But what's it got to do with me? In fact, all of this Christian faith business, what's it got to do with me? Well, I want to look at this single verse from 1 Timothy. I'm going to work backwards, really, through the verse to see why it has everything to do with everyone here. What's it got to do with me, number one? It's got to do with you because you are a sinner. Now that might sound like a bit of an old-fashioned word. That might sound like a word that you're not sure exactly what it means. You know it's something sort of bad, but not really what it is. Well, can I tell you, it's not just really bad people who are sinners. People made that mistake even in Jesus' day. 
Because people looked at Jesus and said, this man receives sinners. And sometimes we have this confusion in our minds where we have saints and sinners. And saints, well, they're floating through life, you know, being holy. With frisbees stuck on the back of their heads like you see in the old pictures. And sinners, well, they're the ones skulking in the shadows up to no good. Well, can I tell you, that's not the picture we get from the Bible. As we read through the Bible, even the biggest of its heroes are flawed, are broken, are not the people they ought to be. Here's Noah. Out of all the people in the world, he was the only one that listened to God and believed and was saved. Yet we see him at the end of his life making all sorts of errors. Here's Abraham, the father of the faithful, stepping out into the unknown in faith. And we see him lying to save his own skin. Well, here's David, King David, the great king, the psalmist. And we see him committing adultery and committing murder. And here's his son, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. But fool, sin makes fools of us all. And sin makes a fool of Solomon. And here are the disciples. What a bunch. They're following Jesus, but when the going gets tough, they all get going. We're not hanging around. Well, only one. And that's Peter who stays around just enough time so he can swear his head off. And here's Paul, the man who wrote these verses. A man who hated the church. A man who hated Jesus. A man who did all he could to stamp out Christianity. You see, sinners are not just awful people. It's not just international terrorists and, and muggers and drug dealers and mean girls and school bullies and dodgy businessmen and corrupt politicians and kids who wear black balaclavas and do wheelies down the street, which apparently is a terrible thing to do. Yes, they are sinners, but they're not the only ones. So are those sweet little old grannies that you know. So is every A-star student, or whatever the equivalent is nowadays that you know. So is the employee of the month. So are the kids who don't do wheelies. So is everyone who attends church. So is everyone who stands at the front in church. How can I say that? Is it because I know everyone? No. But I do know that God is perfect. Perfect in his holiness perfect in his love, perfect in his justice, and he gives us a perfect law to live by. And the Bible tells us, Paul, elsewhere tells us, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we've fallen well short. You know, we don't need VAR to come and draw the line and show us, it's our toenail that's just stepping over the line. We're a long, long way from where we should be. We're a million miles away. In the 18th century, there's a man called John Wesley, who some of you will have heard of. And he said that even in our very best moments, all we're doing is splendid sins. And right in the Old Testament, Isaiah says that all of our righteousnesses, that means all our good stuff, all our coming to church, all our being nice, all our being kind. He says all of our righteousness are like filthy rags. They're worth nothing. You know, I try to think of a, a sort of modern day equivalent for filthy rags. And I thought of this. You remember a few years ago in London, there was a news item about the sewers. That the sewers were being by, blocked up by something called a fat bag. Do you remember this story? And this fat bag was covered an area of two football pitches and weighed as much as 11 double-decker buses. But what was it? Well, it was a congealed mass 
of wet wipes, grease, cooking fat and sewage in one gigantic lump. Lovely. And some fellow's job was to go down and break it up. Yeah, thanks very much for that job. Well, look, here's all, all our good stuff. All our good stuff is like this fat bag. It's horrible. It's useless. Elsewhere, the Bible says our sin, it, it puts us in debt. So here we are, owing a trillion pounds. And there's nothing in our bank. And all we've got in our pockets is a little piece of fat bag. We can do nothing. But if that's right, if we are so hopeless, you still might say, well, so what? I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. I'm only human. We're all just human. Well, the second thing this verse tells us is that you need to be saved. You know, the other week, uh, we were in Ormskirk. I can't explain why. We were. <laughs> I think it's because I've got a free travel pass. I like to travel around. We went, we went for an afternoon to Ormskirk. And we looked around the, 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 the church. That was quite interesting, actually, the church. And then we went around the streets. Oh, there's not a great deal there, to be honest with you. But we were going down one street, and we saw this shop. And it was a barber shop. And it had a big black sign. And in silver letters, it said, Barbers. Now, you might be too surprised by that, you know. You'd expect, if it was a cake shop, it might be surprising to say barbers. No, it was, it was a barber shop. And it said barbers. But underneath, in silver letters, it said John 3, 16. And I'm guessing a lot of you know what that verse is. Probably the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. So I'm presuming that the fellow who ran this shop was a Christian. And he wanted people to know, you know. And he put this verse, that's grace. But I have to confess... I felt an overwhelming urge to run into the shop, find the proprietor, and say, what must I do to be shaved? <laughs> I've been playing on my mind for weeks, but I, I didn't, I didn't. Well, can I have a Samson haircut? No, I didn't say anything like that, no. But the thing is, the verse is actually, what must I do to be saved, you probably know. And that's a common theme in the Bible. Some of, you, some, of you, some of you might think that's a Christian word, but it's not. It's a biblical word. And more than that, you know, it's part of every culture. I think the biggest sort of cultural thing in our, our world at the moment, in the film world, is these Marvel things. They're what are the Marvel books all about. They're all about a saviour. They're all about a rescuer. They're all about a deliverer. You know, whether that's a Superman or Spider-Man or Wonder Woman, whoever it might be. But the whole Bible is one great rescue mission. So we get the creation of the world in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Then in 3, everything falls apart. Adam and Eve sin, they fall, and God pronounces a curse and a judgment upon them. And then he says, but I'm going to do something about it. And the rest of the Bible really is that rescue mission being outplayed. And the Old Testament, you read through it, is full of stories of rescue. Whether it's Noah being rescued in his ark. Whether it's Joseph being sold for the price of a slave and then saving his family. Whether it's Moses going to Egypt and God saving his people through the blood of a lamb. Whether it's David defeating Goliath as God's anointed king. Now, we're not facing flood or, or famine or slavery or some big giant who wants to knock our block off, are we? But we are facing our sins. And as the Old Testament ends, the New Testament starts, we get Matthew. And Matthew starts, well, it starts off with a genealogy, so we, we skip over them, they're too hard to understand. And then we come to the very first narrative in the New Testament. And the very first narrative in the New Testament is the angel coming to Joseph and saying to Joseph, look, Mary's going to have a son. You're going to call his name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. The one thing we've just seen, we've all got. So what's it got to do with me? You're a sinner. 
You need to be saved. You need to be saved from what? Well, because God is great and holy, he must judge all sin. You're a sinner, you need a saviour. The last thing we see in these verses is Jesus is the saviour you need. This is exactly why he came. You know, Jesus was an incredible teacher, but he didn't come to be a great teacher. He worked some amazing miracles, but he didn't come to be a miracle worker. He sets us the greatest example we could ever have, but he didn't come to live a life as a good example. He came, as the verse tells us, to save sinners. That's why the King of Glory came down to the filth and squalor of Bethlehem. That's why he lived in the obscurity and poverty that he did. That's why he suffered injustice. That's why he suffered torture. That's why he was murdered. To save sinners. That's why he lived a perfect life. Always loving and obeying his father. Always caring for others. Always telling the truth. You know, one time Jesus said the greatest commandment is that you love God with all of your heart and the second is that you love your neighbour as yourself. There he's saying, look, the whole point of your life is to worship God and to live for the welfare of others. Now, have you lived your whole life doing that? No, you haven't, and neither have I. And the Lord Jesus Christ lived the life that you should live but can't. He came to save sinners by the life he lived. He came to save sinners, and that's why he went to the cross. You know, I, was, I became a Christian when I was 17, in between the, the lower and upper sixth at the summer camp. And I went back into the sixth form, and on the first day, I went back into school. I went to a Church of England school, and we used to have communion on the very first day of the new year. And we walked from the school over to the church, which was next door. And I was walking with this lad, and he turned to me and he said, well, what was so different about Jesus dying on the cross? You know, loads of people went to, to crosses, didn't he? And I thought, what an amazing question to get asked as a young Christian. And the answer I gave, I thought, was absolutely rubbish. I didn't really, I couldn't really think it through. I was only really, really a Christian for two weeks, so I didn't really give a very good answer. And it always haunted me that I didn't really answer this lad very well. And then we, school finished and he went off to university and I went off to work. And a couple of years later, I was sitting uh, in, in Bridge Chapel and he came into the church. And he'd been converted, but he was at a university. And I was always like, phew, you know, I thought I'd blown that one. And here he is. <laughs> but what answer would I have given to him? What made the, the cross of Jesus different? Well, first of all, who he is. That he's the son of God. That he's lived this perfect life. But more than that, I'd say what makes the cross different is what he achieved. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he was a substitute dying in the place of others. And that means that if you turn from your sin and trust in him, if you recognise that you can't do it yourself and fully rest upon him, then your sin, in all of its awfulness, has been placed upon him at the cross. And his perfect life, in all of its beauty, in all of its glory, is given over to you. That's what makes the cross different. Oh, and by the way, he rose again from the dead. That's another thing as well. And these words were written by Paul. And you might look at the beginning and say, he says it's trustworthy and deserving. How does he know that? Well, because it's happened to him. You know, the other week in, the, in church, in, in Grace, in Hellwood, Sydney quoted this thing from an advertising uh, executive who'd done this thing on what were the key questions that people of different generations want to be answered? What's the most important question? Now, this was done by advertising executives, so obviously you have to take that with a pinch of salt. You know, advertising is sometimes described as, as, as encouraging people to spend money they haven't got to buy what they don't need, so, you know. <laughs> so, but what did they say? They said, well, baby boomers, 
That's people born between 1946 and 1964. So that includes me and a few other people of my age around here, I know. Well, you're a baby boomer. And the most important question for any baby boomer, that this executive said, is it true? Is it true? Is something true? But for the next generation, Generation X, apparently, that's from 64 through to the end of the 70s, maybe, their question is, is it real? And after the Generation X, come the Millennials. And their question is, is it good? And then comes Generation Z, apparently. And their question is, is it beautiful? And finally, we get Generation Alpha, 2013 onwards. Kids. And their big question is, is it trustworthy? Now, I say, I don't know how true all those things are. But it seems to me this verse ticks all of those boxes. Is it true? Well, you, your bottom dollar, it's true. Is it real? Is it good? Is it beautiful? Is it trustworthy? Yes, to all of those questions. And I and every person who is baptised this evening, and more importantly, God, wants you to know this one thing. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners.